My first job, do you guys remember your first job that you had? The first job I got paid by somebody that was, wasn't my mom or dad uh, was sacking potatoes in my uncle's uh, grocery store, little red and white grocery store in a little bitty town. Not exactly a great job. Uh, I think I was probably 11, 12 years old, something like that. Uh, but it's kind of a demeaning job even if, you know, you're only 11 or 12 years old. Sacking potatoes meant that you, you got this great big gunny sack, I mean like this big, and they'd drag it back in there on this really dirty floor in this old back room where, you know, nobody else would ever go there, and they'd dump them out on the floor and they'd give you these sacks, and you had to go through it, and you know, it was a really hard job. You put the potatoes in the sack, <laughs> was what, what it was. And, and have you ever smelled a rotten potato? Oh, nasty. One of the nastiest things in the world is a rotten potato. There's always, you know, the guy that was putting them in the sack, would, in the bag, would always put one rotten potato in there for 12-year-olds, and it would stink, and, and there you were. You, you know, it's just demeaning. You didn't have to weigh them. You didn't have to count them. You just filled the bag up with potatoes. And then when you were done with that, then you could go sweep his dirty floor. But that's what you did before they would trust you with sacking groceries for the public. You know, you worked your way up from sacking potatoes to being trusted with putting groceries in the sack and actually seeing people face to face. You know that before you can own a McDonald's you have to work in a McDonald's? They just don't let anybody just own a McDonald's. You have to somehow be involved. You have to know what it's like to uh, meet the public and to fix the meals and to be on the backside. But you just don't automatically say I just want to own a McDonald's and they say well that's great. Rock band Van Halen used to have a strange thing in their contract. It was called the M&M &M Clause. And uh, Roth explained that in the contract it said that there was to be a bowl of M&Ms backstage with all of the browned M&Ms removed. And he thought, man, he's a weirdo anyway, you know. What's, what's he got against the browned M&Ms? And he said it really made a lot of sense because they were one of the first groups that used to take like, you know, nine, eighteen wheelers and do these kind of not real big venues. They were breaking into some of the smaller places and most, most bands would take like three trucks, they'd roll in with eight or nine of these big trucks with all this equipment and he said that, you know, some of these venues that they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to who was there and sometimes it would be unsafe. The stage might not hold them or the doors might not be big enough to get their massive equipment in. So in their contract, which was like reading the yellow pages, they put this clause in that said about the M&Ms. And he said when he would get to the site, he would go backstage and see if the M&Ms were there. Because if the M&Ms were not there, then he knew that they had not read that whole contract. And then they would go through everything and make sure the stage was heavy enough and all this stuff. He said one time in Colorado that it really saved their life because the stage was not heavy enough to hold what they were going to put on it. And the M&Ms weren't there. And so he knew that they had not paid attention to the little things. If you are not trustworthy in the little things, you will not be trustworthy in the big things. Seems those most people who do the most people who do the most with their lives, you really leave a mark and an influence, know how to do what they can do, and they also take care of the small things. Most of us want to do something. I think most of us want to leave a mark. Most of us aren't here just to suck air, but we're here to do something with our lives and to make a difference, to have an influence. We're going through some parables this summer um, of Luke and, and where he teaches those who wanted to learn about the kingdom of God. Last week we had my favorite parable, I think many of yours too, the prodigal son. Wow, I love that parable. You know, it, it's just about the heart of God, about how God uh, loves us so much. And I was saying to Nina afterwards, I said, you know, if that parable were not in scripture, I honestly think it might lessen my knowledge of God a little bit because that just speaks so clearly to who God is and who Jesus is. But right after the 15th chapter there of Luke, Jesus gives this other parable, and this isn't easy. It's a parable that we have today. We really should just skip over this, because that's what most people do. Listen to this, Luke 16, 1 to 9. 
Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked first, how much do you owe my master? 800 gallons of olive oil, he replied. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe? 1,000 bushels of wheat. And he told them, take your bill and make it 800. Oh, excuse me, I, I missed some. 800 gallons of olive oil. The manager told him, I hope you can keep up, Jeff. Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 400. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill, make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it's gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Is that really in the Bible? Did you know that was in the Bible? How many of you knew that that was in the Bible? Now be honest. A few of you. Okay, good. How many of you had wanted to forget that that was in the Bible? Yeah, most of us go, this is strange. Jesus commends a dishonest manager and says, you did well, you're crooked. You, you did the right thing. Well, it very seldom gets preached on. I'm just not that bright. So we're, we're going to do this today. Don't expect me to answer all the questions. Here's the disclaimer. I'm not here to teach you about the problems of the Bible. I'm here to proclaim the gospel to you. But there's some very powerful truth here. Now, now let's review this. A man had a job. He was a manager. Said he had supervision over the master of the rich man's affairs. And he was wasting the money. So the master calls him in and he gives him notice. And the guy may be dishonest, but he's no dummy. You know, he, he knows that he's not suited to do anything else. He says, I can't dig. Look at my hands. I've never been able to dig. And, and I'm accustomed to my lifestyle. So I'm not going to turn into a beggar. So he launches his plan. He contacts some of his people who owe the, the rich man money, accounts that he's been mismanaging, and he negotiates with them. He says, how much you owe? Okay, 50% of that's all right. How much do you owe? Okay, 80% is okay. So he goes around passing out these gifts to his clients, thinking, I may not have a job, but I got some friends, right? And we think, man, that guy's smart. But wait until the master hears. <laughs> wait until the guy hears that he just settled the account for 50% and for 80%. Then, then what's going to happen? And here's the twist in the parable. Parables never go as planned. Every one of them. You know, you're going along just fine saying, I think I know how this is going to turn out. And then, bam, Jesus pulls the rug out. I said, no, it didn't turn out that way. Because you see, this is about God. And you think you've got this all figured out. And you don't think like I think. You see, I, I'm much different than that. These aren't just nice little stories. And usually where the twist is is where the meaning is. Now, some people think, and I don't know. Some people think that what he did was the, the manager just gave away his commission. I don't know. Doesn't say that here. Could be. There, there could be, you know, I think we're getting pretty deep into imagining what Jesus was trying to do when you do that. But that's what some people, and we call them scholars, and they write books. And so they might know more than us. I don't know. Maybe they don't. Maybe they're just trying to answer all the questions instead of just looking at what the meaning is here. But when the master finds that, he goes, hey, well done. You did a good job. You're no dummy. I knew I'd hired the right guy. You're not working for me anymore, but you're no dummy. <laughs> In fact, you're shrewd. You're creative. You land on your feet. And we say, gosh, Jesus, you were doing so well with that whole prodigal thing, and now this is a bomb. I mean, bad day? Well, you know, what's with this? 
You telling this to be deceitful and crooked? That the end justifies the mean just to get ahead any way that we can? That doesn't sound right. It's not. Two words that I want to focus on here. The entire parable, I think, kind of hangs on these. The first one is steward. I know your NIV doesn't say steward, it says manager. The old King James says steward. Uh, but it's kind of the same thing. It's the same word, this way it's translated. The point is, is that he had responsibility. Because he didn't own this stuff. He was just the steward, the manager of this. The owner trusts him. And Jesus is telling this parable, it says, to the disciples. And, you know, he's looking to them and looking beyond them to, to us. And they are responsible and we are responsible. We, we often speak about stewardship, which is just kind of a churchy way to talk about how we're managing what God has given to us. I think it's insightful that people are always going to do something with money that they don't have yet. Have you ever noticed that? It's like when the Mega Millions gets up there and, the, and people are standing in line and they go by and they interview people and they go, well, what are you going to do if you win this $250 million? And he says, well, I'm, I'm going to give it all away. That's what I'm going to do. If I won, I would give it all away. Really, you're going to give it all? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd buy my parents a new house and then I'd give it all away to charity. Really? Well, I'd buy my parents a house and, and I need a vacation and then I'd give it all away. You know how that goes. But it's always, if they've got this abundance, you know, that they're going to give it all away. Right? And that dollar that they're buying that ticket with, oh, it's just a dollar. No responsibility with this at all, see? I could just, just waste it. Why, well, I, I can't do anything with that dollar, but if I've got a bunch of money, now if I've got more money than what I need, how many of you have ever had more money than what you need? Right? But we always think when that day comes, then I'm going to get generous. When that day comes, then I will have this heart that feels for these other people, and I, I won't be greedy like people that have money and don't do that. No, that will change me, having more than what I need. Isn't it always when I have more, when I have extra? But the steward is to take care of the little in order to be trusted with more. Because everything I am or have belongs to God. Now that's the reality. Everything is at least borrowed. You know, we actually own nothing. We, we live in a, an eternal world. We are eternal creatures by God's design in His image. And what's around us is not eternal. And we are really just borrowing everything that we have. Everything that we see will cease to be someday but us. And you stop thinking about that, you know, it's like the things, most of the things that we're concerned about and that we try to own and have, it's really insignificant. It's like saying, you know, I own the sun, yeah. Um, or I own happiness. If you want happiness, you have to buy it from me. You know, it's ridiculous, isn't it? We're, but, but these things are really intangible things. We, we think that they look like they're something, but really they're not. And when it comes to management or stewardship of God's gift to us, we, I think we are wise to take an inventory. That's what the manager did. He said, well, let's see. What's really within my power? What do I own? Well, there's one thing I can do. I can give these guys a break. You see, all I do is finance and business. So for us, what has God given to you? What are you managing? You may look in your pocket and you say, I'm not managing much, don't have much here. See, there's, there's never much in my management. But, uh, well, remember that maybe you don't have more financial wealth because you can't handle more financial wealth. Did you ever stop and think about that? Maybe God has only given us enough finances that we can handle. Maybe if we had more, that we would mismanage the whole thing. If we are not faithful with the little bit that we have, what makes us think that if we had more, would make us more faithful? It's exactly the opposite. So, so maybe it's a gift that we don't have too much. But take an inventory. Look at your wealth as being God's. That means that your car is God's, your laptop's God's, your cell phone's God's, your house is God. God's. Everything that you have is God's. 
That's, that's your inventory. And there's so much more than just managing wealth. We have relationships. Some people are great influencers. Some people can influence other people. They may not have material wealth, but people want to do what they want to do. They're influencers. I think you know some people like that. They're just natural born leaders. When they say, I think we ought to do this, everybody goes, yeah. It's not that they're smarter than everybody else. They just influence other people. Remember one time I had a youth group and there was a kid in the youth group that was, he was cooler than the other kids. Let's just say it out the way it is. I mean, he was, he was just cooler than the rest of the kids and all the kids in the youth group knew that he was cooler than the rest of the kids. And we would just start getting someplace, going somewhere, and he would lead them off, you know, to Coolville. We'd just start going towards God and he would lead them off to wherever. And one time I got him aside. I said, you know, you, you are, you're cooler. All the kids look up to you. You know, you're the leader here. Oh, no, man, I'm just cool. You know. No, you're really, you're the leader here. Don't you know that? And when you look back on this 10 years, are you going to be proud of the way that you've led these kids? Because you see, they're looking to you. They're saying, what do you, what do you think we should be? What do you think we should do? Everyone has been given management of something, of some talent. Take an inventory. What can I do? It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be important. As a matter of fact, remember that God uses the little things. He said the least will be the greatest. The last will be first. That's his kind of economy. So we may not be heroes or famous or the best about anything, but what can you do? What are your talents? What has God given to you? Now after the parable, Jesus went on to give the punchline, so to speak, we pick this up in verse 10. He said, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Worldly wealth and the dishonest manager of the parable are used as a lesson by Jesus to teach us that we are all stewards, we are all managers, and that God calls us to be, and here's the second word, shrewd. Mm. Shrewd means wise crafty, creative. Maybe it's because this parable is difficult and seldom read that so many people have missed this word to the church that as Christians we're to be creative and shrewd and wise and crafty. The sad reality is that often the church acts as if being non-creative is godly. That being boring is righteous, right? And that we don't need to be as creative as the world because, well, this is the church, and, and we can get by with less. Often excellence is considered to be a worldly goal, an attribute, and mediocrity in the church is considered to be godly. It can be embarrassing. Think of the arts. Music sometimes... And I'm, I know that you've heard this. I'm not talking about our music. Our music's great. But on the radio, sometimes there's Christian bands that quite honestly, if, if, if it weren't Christian lyrics, it would not make it on the radio. Do you know what I mean? They, they just take a rock band. They just start putting Jesus lyrics in it. And they say, oh, this is cool. And we play it on the Christian radio. Why? Because, well, it's God's stuff. And it doesn't need to be as good as secular stuff. Why? Why, do, why does it have to be like that? Why do we have to aim at mediocrity in the church and be non-creative? It must be Christian because it's just not that good. Graphics and advertising and... Man, I, I've, I've seen some movies, some Christian movies. It's like, gee, this is the best that you could do with this topic? And some of them are very good. And others are like, man, this is... I'm embarrassed. What, what are we doing? Why are we aiming here? Where, where do we get the idea 
that if it isn't too good, well, it'll do for the church. We used to have the phrase, we were working on somebody's stuff. And maybe you were there helping with their house or whatever, and, and, and you had a little mistake, and you look at it, and you go, to the guy whose house it is, you go, well, it's good enough for who it's for. <laughs> right? And we'd laugh about that. When you're working on church stuff, it's never good enough for who it's for. You see, the bar is much higher. We need to be creative and ingenious, shrewd. Genesis 3.1, I think, tells us where this we get this whole idea. Genesis 3.1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animal, animals that the Lord God had made. The old snake in the garden, crafty. I think that's where we're getting this idea in the church, that we can just aim low, that we don't need to be creative. We're getting it from the old crafty one. When we believe that serving God means that we just aim at mediocrity rather than excellence, we have believed that crafty lie. Jesus says that's just not so. What's really valuable, godly truths, the gospel that we just received last week in, in Luke 15 about the prodigal son, about God's, God's heart for us, God's love for us. This should, is more, this should be more important than all money, Everything else to us, you see. Like the dishonest, shrewd manager, we should be creative and shrewd about how we reach this world with that truth. Now the word shrewd, you might have remembered, you probably have heard that one other place, Matthew 10, 16. Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves, therefore be shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. As he's sending his disciples out into the world, Shrewd as snakes, innocent as doves. Shrewd as snakes, creative, ingenious, determined, looking for an opening on how to get this gospel to someone. Be more creative than the devil, he's saying. He's crafty. He's creative. He's also deceitful. I'm not calling you to be deceitful. I'm calling you to be determined and creative. And he says, and yet be innocent, be holy. What if Christians were as creative and shrewd in the church as we are in business? What if we really believe that what we are, quote, selling, I say that figuratively, the gospel, gospel that sets captives free and gives new life, is so important that we would do anything to see it thrive. As if, if we lose, we go bankrupt and we're out of a job. What, what if the church had that kind of creativity and shrewdness and determination. You've probably heard of the Salvation Army. We, we all throw dollars in their buckets every year. Back in the 1860s in London, the founder, William Booth, and his wife, Catherine, were kicked out of most of the churches in London. Didn't want to have anything to do with him. He just wasn't doing things the right way. He was just way too determined to reach people with the gospel. He thought that they ought to have a, a dinner for the prostitutes and the homeless and the drug and the, and the alcoholics of London and get them in the church. And while they were there for dinner, they could preach the gospel to them. And the church says, oh, that's ridiculous. We don't do things like that here. Booth wanted to stand outside on the street corner and have a little band play to attract a crowd and then preach the gospel to them. They said, that's stupid. That, uh, church doesn't do stuff like that. That, that's not God. That's what the world does. Got kicked out of the church. It's a good thing. None of the ministers of the city would have anything to do with him. In two years' time, 250,000 homeless prostitutes and alcoholics came to the Lord in the city of London. 250. Let that sink in. You know how many? That's more than all the people in Lexington came to the Lord in two years' time because of his ministry. They had thousands of people that went out on the street then. He actually held an evangelism campaign in a, in a cemetery one time. But he was relentless. He was shrewd, very creative. And of course, then he opened up his missions and before the, the men and women could eat the meal, and they were hungry, he fed them the Word of God. <laughs> 
still the way they do things today, isn't it? It's very creative. Jesus says, use your godly affluence for godly influence. We say, well, I, I don't have much. I don't think I have much affluence, really. Really. Or if you take your inventory, you're saying that God has shortchanged you? Saying that God looked at you and said, well, everybody else gets some gifts but you? No, you're not going to get anything? Is, is that what you're saying? You really think God's cheated you? You know, you really don't need much. Again, we're not talking about great gifts. We're talking about your gifts. The old African proverb says that if you think you're too small to make an influence, just try spending the night in a closed room with a mosquito. You'll find out how small something can be to make an influence in your life. What do you have to make a difference? Money? It's God's money. Use it wisely. Talent? Talent's given to you by God. Use it wisely. Connections? Sometimes, you know, some of us just know somebody that knows somebody and we can put people together in powerful ways. Use it for Him. Use it shrewdly. Use your godly affluence. Aim high. I will do more than belong. We say, I will participate. I will do more than care. I will help. I will do more than believe. I will practice. I will do more than be fair. I will be kind. I will do more than forgive. I will forget. I will do more than dream. I will work. I will do more than teach. I will inspire. I will do more than earn. I will enrich. I will do more than give. I will serve. I will do more than live. I will grow. 1969, Malcolm Muggeridge, a British journalist, the editor of Punch, a very satirical magazine, went to Calcutta to, for a job that he had. BBC had hired him to do a documentary on Mother Teresa. She didn't want to do the movie. Church leaders talked her into it, and when she finally agreed, she said, let us do something beautiful for God. Muggeridge filmed her, and there was very low lighting in the hospice where she was, and he didn't think that they would get film. And when they, in those days, they had real film, and in those days when they reviewed the film, there was this glow around her, this aura around Mother Teresa. And he said, it, it had to be her. It had to be kind of the, the Shekinah, the, the love that was in this lady that just kind of illumined the room around her. And later he wrote a book about her and he used that phrase, Something Beautiful for God is the title. And he eventually became a Christian because of that experience of meeting Mother Teresa and seeing all of this. Doing something beautiful for God. I think we each, I know, we each have that capacity. The gospel is the most precious thing that you will ever be given. The most precious commodity that you will ever be entrusted with is this knowledge that you have in your heart that God is not waiting for you to do something to accept you. But God has already accepted you through the person of Jesus Christ. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. That his love is a given for you. That's the gospel that we have been entrusted with. And we are to be shrewd about how we take this into the world. You should be connivers on how to get your neighbors and your family members and, and our friends to listen to this gospel, this treasure that we have. I think that's what Jesus is saying here. Amen.